I'm going to introduce projectile motion. This is, uh, again, basic, just a basic introduction, and then we'll get to work on different types of problems. So a projectile is an object that um, is very similar to what happens in free fall. Technically, it's only subject to the force of gravity. I mean, if an object's falling through air, it has air resistance. No good. That's technically not free fall. So uh, you can't have a self-propelled object like a rocket or an airplane or even a glider, which is not self-propelled, but why wouldn't a glider be valid? A glider has uh, lift on its wings. It has uh, an extra force, and that's not just the force of gravity. Baseball, football, the bullet, those are all examples. Um, this is the kind of path that the object would take. If you want to check for, uh, do a simulation on projectiles, you can go to that uh, website that I've indicated below there. It's a pretty good simulation. Uh, and then you can play around with it and you can see the different uh, patterns that come out. But essentially, we're talking about a shape that looks very much like, mathematically, a parabola. And so the uh, parabola lends itself to a good analysis. It is a, um, essentially can be analyzed using a quadratic equation. And the only problem is that mathematically, that's great, uh, the quadratic equation would be y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, except for the point that we also have to include time. So while you may be able to draw a parabola using that equation, we have to include time. That means it's a third variable. So we can't have just that simple quadratic formula uh, be the uh, way we analyze this we have to break the motion up. And in what two directions can you break this up? You can break this up, you can see the ball going forward, okay? And you can also see that it goes up and it comes down. So we can break it into horizontal and vertical motion. And um, so it's gonna be an X and a Y. Okay, so this is an introduction into two-dimensional motion. And in fact, let's look at a different PowerPoint. Let's look at this one. In one-dimensional motion, you can see that a, a ball goes up, comes back down, and there it is. Now, the length of this arrow is proportional to how fast it's going. The longer the arrow, the faster it's going. So as it goes up, the arrow gets shorter. It's losing speed, losing velocity, until finally at the top, the velocity is, is zero. It's got to stop and come back down. And when it does that, it gains velocity coming down in the negative direction. And so we call that a velocity vector. The length of the vector indicates the strength or magnitude of the vector. And the direction, the, the, the which way the arrow is pointing is the, is the direction. So uh, vectors, again, uh, are unlike scalars. Vectors have a magnitude or a, or a strength or a value, and they have a direction unlike, let's say, temperature, which is just a scalar, or mass, which is just a scalar. It has no direction. So you can see the velocity vector goes up, gets shorter and shorter. So that might be, you know, 10 miles an hour, 5 miles an hour, 2 miles an hour, 0. Now it's minus 2, minus 5, minus 10, minus 15, and minus 20. How do I know those actual numbers? I don't. Uh, these are just relative. But if they did have numbers, I might be able to use a scale. For instance, like one millimeter equals one mile an hour. Um, and so that would indicate the length of, of that thing there. You could draw it that way. However, in two dimensions, we need both the up. That was a one-dimensional analysis. In two dimensions, we need both in two arrows, and one in the y and one in the x. Let's see what that looks like. There's the both arrows moving up and you can see what's happening to the y arrow and you can also observe what's happening to the x arrow okay up coming down as it goes up the arrow gets shorter until at the top it's zero and then it becomes more and more negative till it hits the ground very much like one dimensional motion the difference is what about the horizontal motion do you notice anything different there if you notice it stays the same you're correct does that seem odd it does. It, it should seem odd because in real life, you would have air resistance and the horizontal arrow 
as it moves forward, should get shorter and shorter, but it doesn't because we're ignoring air resistance. We're ignoring air. If we include it, it gets very complicated to analyze, and it kind of obscures the physics behind the, the very basic physics behind uh, the parabola. The parabola goes from a very uh, simple, straightforward parabola, whereas a nice, clean parabola like that, well, it's not a great parabola. Let me try that again. Um, let's see, you have a nice, straight, straight, clean parabola. That's not bad. And then we have one, if you include air resistance, what happens is it doesn't go up quite as high, and it comes down much, much faster. So that's uh, what will happen with um, air resistance, and so it can't be analyzed as simply. And so you need to basically learn a lot more before we include air resistance. So we're going to learn the basics here of parabolic motion. And so we've got our two vectors. We've got a y vector and an x velocity vector. And you can see what happens. Okay, so the y gets smaller and smaller, goes to zero. The x never remains the same. For an instant, it's not moving up or down, but it's still moving forward. For an instant, the object is still moving forward, and now it starts to pick up a downward velocity, and it increases like that. So what happens? Well, essentially, this is the overall pattern of what happens to the object. You have the y vector getting smaller and smaller and smaller and vanishing. There's the dy. It's gone. And then on the way back down, it picks up speed Okay, on the way down. The x never changes. The x remains the same. Again, we're ignoring air resistance, so it's an idealized plot. In fact, if you were to analyze uh, a golf ball doing this, you would predict maybe the golf ball goes 400 yards. In real life, you know, it would probably only go 250. But it's the way we have to calculate. This uh, arrow in the middle, if you're familiar with vectors, you'll know that it is the sum of the vertical and the horizontal vector. If you're not, for now, consider it the direction in which the ball is actually moving. Okay, there it is. You see the ball starting to tip over. Now it's going only horizontal because there's only Vx present. And now the ball is starting to fall forward and down. Down and forward, and even more down and still forward. And you can see what happens with that object. So two key factors. Uh, two key factors, is how what angle you launch it at and the speed in which you throw it upward or fire it upward. There's also a, a minor third one, is it what altitude you're at. If you're at the same level or if you're at a different level, that would also make a difference. That's secondary to these two, uh, two key factors. So uh, we won't do that one, but... Um, let's say a ball is thrown at uh, 20 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees. How can we determine its upward velocity? Well, um, it kind of looks like a bit of a triangle. And if we make a triangle of it, you can see that I can get my y vector. And that's v initial y. Because remember, the y doesn't remain the same. The x does, but the y gets shorter and shorter, becomes zero, and then changes. So we're going to call this its initial y velocity, and there's its x velocity, which doesn't change, so it doesn't really matter whether it's initial or final, it never changes. So we've got a right triangle there, and the 20 is the hypotenuse, so we can use trig to determine the sides of that triangle. And so the sine of 60 is the opposite over the hypotenuse, and so therefore we can find out what that is. In fact, that will come out to 17.32. You must be in degree mode in order to to do that. If you're in the radian mode, you won't get that answer. Um, and that allows us to use kinematic equations because now we can figure out, okay, well, actually you throw it at 20 meters per second, but actually it's only going up at 17.3. So you can use one-dimensional equations to analyze how high it goes, how long it takes to go up, how long it takes to come back down. That's the time at which it will be in the air. And so that's very critical to determining how far it will go forward. What about the x motion? What trig function? Well, that's going to be the cosine, okay, the adjacent side. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And if you do that calculation, you'll get 10 meters per second. So there's the breakdown. It's moving forward at 10 meters per second and upward at 17.32. So now we have to take our kinematic equations and change them a little bit. 
the x direction would be pretty easy because it never changes. That's, pretty, that's a constant velocity. And constant velocity calculations are very simple. There's no accelerations involved, no decelerations, and so it's just distance, you know, equal, distance equals rate times time. So let's see what happens to our kinematic equations. <clears throat> well, without going through all of that, let me just show you this. There's the first kinematic equation. I, I do three of them. There is a fourth, but I just do three. The, um, the, the first one is um, V final equals V initial plus AT. Well, we, no long, we have two dimensions now, so we have to differentiate. Since there's acceleration involved, we now have to, um, in the y direction only, in the y direction only, we're going to say this is its uh, velocity in the y direction. The v initial y is what you saw, 17.3. That would be the starting velocity. This would be maybe perhaps the velocity at the peak when the velocity becomes zero, or maybe when it hits the ground again, as it's going to be going in the opposite direction at exactly the same speed as this, but negative. Okay. So we'll see it some, how to use that in some problems. We replace A with a minus G. And we're going to say that G equals a positive 9.8 meters per second squared. Always. G, whenever you see G, it will always be a positive 9.8. Uh, never equal a negative 9.8. Uh, you get into complications when you do that. Uh, and so we build in the minus sign because we're only dealing with gravity. We're not dealing with cars accelerating or rockets accelerating. We're only dealing with gravity. And so, um, well, of course, this would be true on any planet, Mars or Moon, but it is single value, at least on the surface. And so we don't have to worry about anything else, but we do build in the minus sign. Second equation uh, is the displacement equation. The initial has to become V initial Y. X is now we're dealing vertically. We have to separate, separate the uh, vertical from the horizontal. There's Y. And we replace A with G minus G. And so there's that equation. The third equation, the third kinematic equation uh, that I teach is this one here. Uh, v final has to be V final Y. V initial has to be V initial Y. A has to be minus G. And X is now Y. Well, that gives me, that's great. Now I can figure out how long it takes to go up and come down but I still have to figure out how far it goes. And as I said, it only amounts to a very basic uh, distance equals rate times time. And there's where the second dimension comes in, equals the velocity in the x direction times the time. Very simple second dimension input. If we had air resistance, we'd have to add an additional acceleration in there, deceleration in this case, it would be three additional equations. Uh, not counting what happens to the y equations as well. So um, those are the equations we're going to use for projectile motion, and I'll be back with other videos to determine, uh, to see how we solve some the typical types of problems and how we solve them.